So, hello, this is Will, Stevie, and Sammy Webb, and this is uh, the Trinity from Scripture. <clears throat> so, the, uh, the preface, a couple things we want to just make sure before we, we get into the topic is uh, uh, some important points. First one is heresy and careful language. So, uh, when you're talking about the Trinity, it is very, very easy to just say a heresy without realizing it. Um, so before we get into that, we're going to cover some heresies and really go over the language we need to use when talking about the Trinity, uh, because even in the early church, they didn't necessarily um, rule out ideas. They ruled out language and certain ways to talk about the Trinity. So that's going to be very important. The next one is that going into this, just realize that this is a divine mystery. But not only that, it's probably the most incomprehensible and greatest divine mystery that God has revealed to us. Um, and then another thing is that this is super rational, so it's above reason, as in we can use reason to figure out certain things about the Trinity, but we can't actually figure out all of it just using reason. We need God's help, God's assistance, and even then, he, uh, we, we, we aren't even, uh, he hasn't revealed everything to us about the Trinity. So um, that's where uh, faith is an essential part. And then the last thing is that this is an essential doctrine. Um, and some might even say that this is the essence of Christianity. So the Trinity is pretty much what makes a Christian a Christian. It's their core claim. So just knowing why you believe in the Trinity. And if someone asks you like, oh, what scripture would you point to? You would know how to answer that. All right. Um, so we're going to pray quick. You pray? Yeah. Father God, we uh, just thank you for allowing me and Samuel to do this uh, ministry, and I just pray that it brings glory to you. I pray that this talk stirs up love for who you are and your nature. And so we just praise your name, Lord, and uh, pray that you are glorified in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the quote we're going to start with is a little long, but it's from uh, Charles Spurgeon, a great uh, Baptist minister. He says, it has been said that the proper study of mankind is man. I believe, it, I believe it is equally true that the proper study of God's elect is God. The proper study of a Christian is the Godhead, the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his father. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. So uh, contemplation of the Trinity, it's not something where we wanna say, um, it's a mystery, so we just don't deal with it. No, we wanna think about it all the time. This is like a, it's a, it's a worshipful contemplation of God. And so it's honoring to God and it's enriching for us. So that's why we're doing this. Okay, so some likely unfamiliar terms uh, to you now, but that will hopefully become familiar by the end of this talk. Um, the first one would be procession. So procession is a, a sort of progression. That's like literally what it means, it's progression. Um, in the Trinity, it just means that the Father is the origin of the Godhead and the Son and the Spirit come from the Father or they proceed from the Father. There is an order within the Godhead based on origin, order based on origin. I bolded that on your outline because that's a good way to think about it. An order based on origin, Father, Son, and Spirit. As it pertains to the Father and the Son, the Christian tradition has used the terms of paternity and filiation to describe the relation between the Father and the Son. So they are eternally Father and Son. Eternal fatherhood and eternal sonhood is paternity and filiation. What makes the Father and the Son distinct has always been true. That's just who God is. It's essential to his character that he is Father, Son, and Spirit. And they are in these relations to each other eternally. Um, the unique term to describe the Son coming from the, from the Father is generation. So the son is eternally generated from the father, not created, but eternally standing in this relation of sonhood, eternally there. He's not created, he didn't come into being, he has always been son uh, in relation to the father. So we say that the son is eternally generated from the father or eternally begotten. Likewise, the same principle applies to the relationship between the father and the son in sending or spirating the Holy Spirit. So the word up there is spiration, that's the technical term, which literally means to breathe forth. This is the eternal relation that the Holy Spirit has to the other members of the Trinity so that he is, uh, uh, by virtue of his procession, via spiration, uh, or being spirated, being breathed forth from the Father and the Son. 
So again, this procession is the order within the Trinity based on their origin. That's how we distinguish the members of the Trinity, by their origin. The Father is the only one that comes from no one. He is, he is unbegotten. The Son is begotten from the Father, and the Spirit is brought forth from the Father and the Son. Uh, so this gives, I think, a lot of strength to John's statement uh, in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. So God is eternally in a perfect giving and receiving relationship of love between the persons of the Trinity. God was absolutely perfect without creation and created out of his love and good pleasure to include, create. Uh, he wants to include creatures, us, into his eternal nature of relational love. So just really cool to think about that. Yeah. Um, and then a couple other things on this before we move on is the the image up here. It, it's it's like a formula to make sure you don't run into any heresies. So, uh, like I said, the early church basically uh, said, "Hey, use this language, not this language, because if you don't use specific language, you run into heresy." So, if you follow this, uh, you really won't run into any of that. So, like when it says, "Son is not the Father," as long as you don't say the Son is the Father, you won't run into a heresy right there. So. This language helps you. Um, but also another thing that I do want to touch on is when we say like the, the father proceeds or like is before the son mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit. A good way to think about it is not in time. So we aren't saying like, oh, it's before them in time. So it's not like the father was there. Then at one point in time, the son came to be. Um, so all of them have always been there. All of them have been eternal. What is good to think about is they were before when it, when it comes to explanations. So the, like the father is the explanation of the son. So the son needs the father to be explained. The Holy Spirit needs the son and the father to be explained, but they've all always been there. Yeah. So um, one last note. Yeah. So I think that there's kind of two ways you can talk, uh, two broad ways that we're going to talk about the Trinity today. First, we're going to cover like basically in a very technical manner, proving one, that the father is God, that the son is God, that the spirit is God, that they're not each other and that they're all God. So that is one way to do it. That's like a very technical way to do it. You get proof text for each of the persons. You get proof text that there's one God, and you get proof text to say that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, etc. Now, it's a very technical way to do it. Um, and Scripture also doesn't lay it out like clearly, like Romans 1, and it says this is the doctrine of the Trinity, and it, and it gives a bunch of proof text. It doesn't do that. Um, so we're going to cover it in that manner, in a very technical way, and then we're also going to talk about what I think is a, the more helpful way to talk about the Trinity, which is to relate it to the gospel as closely as possible. And so we'll get into that. But there's two broad ways to talk about it. And it's, 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 it's not very like heartwarming to think like, mm, the father is not the son. <laughs> like that, that's a very technical way to do it. And it's necessary. And we're going to do that and then transition to a more gospel focused way to talk about the Trinity. So, yeah. So we're going to quick cover some heresies first. I'm going to explain what they are. Then Will uh, might say something on the history of it. Um, so the first one is modalism. So this is basically saying there's no distinction of persons. So that's pretty much saying, hey, God is one God, but he changes forms. So we have this God, he becomes the Son, he becomes the Father, he becomes the Holy Spirit, and there's actually no distinction of persons. Like, they aren't their own things. It's just God changing forms and staying who he is. Um, so that's one heresy. It was ruled out um, thousands of years ago. It's also known as Sabellianism, but that's that's pretty much the essence of it. So if you hear an analogy of like, oh, um, uh, the, the Trinity is like water and uh, water can be ice or it can be um, vapor. Uh, vapor or liquid, mm -hmm. that, that would be uh, a modalistic analogy. Yeah. Yeah. If, if anyone's heard the That's Modalism Patrick video <laughs> yeah. that everybody shares around uh, Easter. And <laughs> so it's a, it's a really funny video, but if you look up That's Modalism Patrick, you'll find it. It's, it's a funny video about the Trinity. Anyway. Um, Yes, so this was condemned as heretical at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. And since then, the church has confessed that God is one being, but three distinct persons. Yeah. Um, another common heresy is Arianism. So that's Jesus is just a creature, as in a lot of the early heresies revolved around specifically the Son. Uh, I would say most of them did. Uh, but it was basically saying that Jesus is not divine, not God. It's just a uh, like the father created a creature and Jesus was just, just human, right? Not, no divine nature in that. Um, yeah, and this was condemned at the Council of Nicaea, which is the first ecumenical council in 325 AD. And St. Athanasius is, a, is an important, incredibly important figure in church history that you should, they should know about. If you were to read one work of church history, like to start, 
you should read uh, On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. That's a really good work to read. If you've like never read any church history before, that's a really good introductory work to read. And he kind of led the charge in the fight for the deity of Christ. Uh, the amazing thing was that most of the bishops at the time were Arians. Most of the bishops in the church at the time were confessing that Jesus was a creature, that he was uh, like a sub-divinity. He was, he, was, he was divine, but only in a, uh, a subsequent or secondary way to the Father. And Athanasius was saying, no, he is fully God. He is fully God in every sense of the word. And he settles on the term homo usias, which means same substance, homo usias, same substance. Uh, and this fits well with what scripture says in Colossians 1 and 2. It says, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And Samuel will talk about those verses a little mm -hmm. bit later. Yeah, and another way to think about Arianism is like a demigod, a uh, part God, part human. But when we are talking about Jesus, we're talking about him fully God and fully human. Right. He was he was both. Um, another uh, another heresy is eunomianism. And not only did they kind of emphasize that the son is a creature, but uh, the big thing that I want to point out here is that they talked about the Holy Spirit as a force. And this is probably the most common heresy you see today that people don't even realize they're doing. Uh, so if you've ever talked about the Holy Spirit and said it, that's eunomianism. You just committed a heresy. So the Holy Spirit is a he. If you if you haven't been referring to the Holy Spirit as a he, uh, you've been uh, accidentally or um, not knowing you've been committing a heresy. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's that's the main thing. Like the Holy Spirit is a person. It's a relational being. So, and see, I just said it there, not he. Um, so we, we have to really focus on our language when it comes to the Holy Spirit and say he. Yeah. Yes, and uh, yes, you basically got that covered there. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, then the last one is partialism. And this is also a big one, and it's just saying that God is uh, made up of parts. So each person is a part of God. So um, one example, again, pro probably the, uh, the Patrick video is when he says, oh, God is like a three-leaf clover. Each, each leaf is part of God. That's partialism. Remember, we're saying that each person of God is fully God, not each person is a third of God. Yeah. Um, so they're all fully God. Yeah. Yeah. It's not 33% plus 33% plus 33%. They're all 100% God. Yeah. Which is difficult to understand, but that's what scripture gives us, and that's what the church confesses. Yeah. And we'll keep going into that. All right. So first person of the Trinity we're going to talk about is the Father. Um, so the first thing we want to say is that uh, the Father is the fount of the Godhead. So kind of what Will was saying earlier, uh, the, the Son and the Holy Spirit uh, come from the Father, right? And so a couple attributes about uh, the Father is, uh, the first one is love. The Father is holy love. That's the best way to describe the Father. So a lot of people think that the Father is just like uh, all wrath. And then when Jesus came, Jesus was just love and no wrath. Well, honestly, both the Father and the Son were pretty much equally wrath and love, but the most common attribute or action given to the Father is those of love. Um, so that, that's the first thing, but uh, it's, it's not just like, oh, he's wrathful. Actually, the number one thing Jesus talked about most was hell and uh, condemnation and um, all, all that. So that's, that's the first thing. But also the Father isn't really disputed. There aren't any like people that were like, oh, the Father doesn't exist. That's that's really what people think of when you first say God. Um, and so it's it's pretty much presupposed. Yes, uh, and I think that there's a, a strong sense in which you can say that the Father is not completely revealed as the Father until the incarnation and Jesus' baptism particularly, where he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Um, so there's a, there's a famous way that B.B. Uh, Warfield is a famous theologian put this. He said, the Trinity is not revealed in the Old Testament and it's also not revealed in the, New in the New Testament. And then he goes on to describe for 3,000, or a couple, like a, a, long, a long time, he goes on to describe uh, how the Trinity is in Scripture. What he means by this, it might sound like, well, of course it is. What he means by it is that the, the Trinity was revealed, um, it was already foreshadowed in the Old Testament, wasn't revealed clearly, and it was presupposed in the New Testament, but it was revealed in history in between the Testaments. It was revealed in the events of the Incarnation and Pentecost. Chiefly. So he's just making the point that these were historical events. It wasn't just the Bible uh, just popped down out of nowhere and that, that's how we get the Trinity. No, the Trinity happened because they revealed, God revealed himself in that way in history and the church worshiped with a Trinitarian mindset 
and then scripture came out of that, right? So that's that's the point there um, of it, the Trinity being revealed within the Testaments. Um, so the technical term for this is that um, the Trinity is adumbrated in the Old Testament. So that just means to shadow forth, to foreshadow. Um, and so we'll say that theologians will say that the Trinity is not clearly revealed in the Old Testament, but is adumbrated there. And then uh, a helpful way to think about it is that of a dimly lit room. So in the Old Testament, we have a dimly lit room. The lights aren't really clear. All the furniture is there, but you can't really see everything exactly clearly. The New Testament comes around and flips the lights on. And then, okay, I see, I see God more clearly now than I did before. And I can, everything was there. I'm just seeing it more clearly. God has revealed himself progressively to us. Um, so that's how we usually speak of it. Yeah. And uh, two more things I want to add. I, I do want to touch on John 14 through 17 right there when we say it's presupposing scripture. John, we aren't going to read chapters 14 through 17 right here. We're just going to sit down and read it. It would take a, a while. But those are the most, uh, uh, isn't it like the most Trinitarian passages in scripture right there. So if you're looking for evidence of the Trinity or specifically the Father, you go to those chapters. Um, but later we're going to have like a lot of verses we're going to read through. Uh, but another thing on the Old Testament is that the Trinity is seen in the Old Testament. So just to give you one quick example is if you just go to Genesis 1, um, it really shows that uh, just like in the creation that all three are there. So there's God, obviously. Then he spoke everything into existence, which is the word. But then also his spirit was hovering over the waters. So everything is there, but it's not really laid out as the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> All right, so uh, for the sun, we have a bunch of verses we're going to go through. Um, the first one we're actually going to touch on is Hebrews 1. Uh, this talks about the exact imprint of his nature and the splendor of his glory. So it says, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Um, and so actually my favorite line in that is the exact imprint of his nature. And so that would really get at that idea that, um, Will brought up like homo usias of the same substance. He's the exact imprint of his nature. Um, and that's, it's talking about the sun there. So the sun is God. And that's one of the points we're technically going to try and prove. Um, so remember, we're proving that they're distinct, that they're each God, and also that God is one. Um, so that's that's the first one. The, ne the next one is going to be Colossians 1 and Colossians 2, 9. Um, and it's going to be talking about uh, the sun being the image of the invisible God or the fullness of God, um, using a little bit different language, but getting at the same point as Hebrews 1. Um, it says in Colossians 1, uh, 15 through 20, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things hold together and he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent for in him all the fullness of god was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross so it's pretty clear right there that it's saying the son is god right is the image of god is the fullness of god uh there's there's no question when it comes to these two uh passages about the son's deity or jesus's deity and then there's one last one i'm going to quick read which is just colossians 2 9 it says for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily very clear yeah yeah those are awesome You're lucky you got to read those i get john one though <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, john one one in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Um, so the big key here is verse 1, where it says, The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you get withness and wasness. And that's the principle that John's trying to establish. He doesn't give you like the whole Trinity in one verse, but a very important distinction of, 
he was with God and he was also, he was God. And so the Trinity, it, it's there. It's just, you know, we have to use particular language to, to tease out how that works. But the word was with God and the word was God. Next passage is 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 6. It says, for even if there are so-called gods, little, little G gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, verse 6, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Okay, so two points to show how significant this verse is. One is the, the language that is used to describe the Father and the Son is just very like close. Um, so describing the Son, it says, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Um, if you were a Jew at the time, you would very clearly know what Paul is doing here. So he is, he is um, taking the Shema, which is the classic confession of, of the Jewish people. So in Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema says, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. So it uses both Lord and God to describe God, those two divine names. And Paul just basically just shoves Jesus into the Shema, and he just makes it Trinitarian. And he, re he recites it and, and rephrases it in a, in a Trinitarian way, where he calls uh, the Father God and, and Lord Jesus. And so throughout Paul's writings, he refers to Jesus as Lord a bunch of times. He explicitly only refers to Jesus and uses the word God, like theos, uh, like I think twice in his letters explicitly, and we'll, and we'll get to that one next. But um, he uses Lord most commonly, but it's not any less significant. It's, it's a divine name described to God alone throughout the Old Testament. And so calling Jesus Lord is extremely significant, and it's referencing back to the Shema. So that's very cool. Um, Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So just very explicit, Paul calls Jesus God right there. And then the last one is John 8.58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So this is again, a very significant passage where Jesus isn't saying, I am God, explicitly with those words, but he's saying, I am. He's using the divine name that God uses in Exodus 3 to speak to Moses. So in the burning bush, Moses says, what shall I, what shall, you've, you've, revealed yourself, you've revealed yourself to me, what should I call you to the Israelites? And he says, tell them I am sent you. Um, I am, like that's the name that I'm giving to myself is I am who I am. And so John says, or uh, Jesus says in John 8, before Abraham was, I am, which is crazy. And he, right after that, the Jews like start to stone him because they're like, we know what's going on here. So people that are like modern people who are saying Jesus never claims to be God, just don't know what they're talking about. Jesus clearly says all throughout, even in the, synop uh, in the synoptic gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, he says he makes clear claims to divinity all the time. By what he does, his actions, he accepts worship. He does things that only God can do, like forgive sins, perform miracles. And he says that he does this on his own authority. Um, so it's just very clear Jesus is claiming to be God throughout the gospels. Uh, one, one more point is when Paul is, is calling Jesus Lord or saying stuff like that, one thing to remember is Paul's context. It's not like he's ignorant of what he's saying. He was a highly respected Jew, right? There are multiple times where he boasts of his accomplishments, or he said he could boast of his accomplishments. He's like, oh, you're, you're Jewish? I'm more, all right? Um, so he knew what he was saying when he said Lord. Um, he didn't do it out of ignorance. Um, okay, so then Holy the Holy Spirit. So this might be the one that... I think probably most Christians maybe could pull, you know, one or two verses to prove that Jesus is God. And obviously the Father, that's not really disputed. But I think most Christians would probably uh, squirm in their seats a bit if you said, prove the deity of the Holy Spirit right now from Scripture. And so our goal is to help you guys out a little bit if that's a struggle and say, no, the Holy Spirit really is God. It's not just a random doctrine we made up. He is God. And it's clear. So the first thing we're going to cover is John 14 through 16. We're not going to read three chapters. We're just going to get some highlights. Um, again, this is one of the most Trinitarian passages in all of scripture. So here in this idea, uh, in this passage, the ideas of the Holy Spirit being the helper and the advocate are the chief uh, ideas here. So John 14, 15 through 17 first is, uh, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Later, John 14, 25, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. 
John 15, 26, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, he will bear witness about me. John 16, 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So we see Jesus constantly refers to the Spirit as um, a he, a personal agent that has a specific role. And also, I, I just, I can't, uh, that John 16, 7 verse is amazing because it would have been impossible as a disciple to say like, oh, it's actually better that Jesus leaves. <laughs> it's like to believe Jesus's words that it's actually better that I go. I'm sure that would have been very difficult. And we should take comfort in that as Christians is that we have the Holy Spirit in us. That is, a, that is an amazing reality and we should be comforted by that. Last one, John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That's it. For that. All right. Um, so moving on to Romans 8, 26 through 27. Um, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not, uh, do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep, or words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, so there are a couple things here, uh, some important things. First thing is that, again, the Spirit is referred to uh, a he. It says the Spirit himself, right? So that's the first thing. So the Spirit is a person, a relational being, right? And you see the Spirit doing certain things, so like uh, interceding, or something like that. But also another thing in this one is we're talking about the mind of the spirit. Um, I believe it it touches on the omniscience of the Holy Spirit. That is uh, that is a godly attribute right there. Uh, the spirit knows, right? So that's that's one important thing to remember about the spirit. When when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, it's not just something uh, regenerating our hearts. It one is a person. Does it uh, now? He does. Uh, regenerate our hearts but also he has all those attributes god has omniscience omnipotence um so all powerful all knowing all present uh love peace all, all that stuff that is the holy spirit and then uh this is just a cool connection here between the old and new testaments but in ephesians four thirty, it says and do not grieve the holy spirit of god by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption and then isaiah sixty three ten. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. So the idea of they grieved the Holy Spirit. Well, you can't grieve an impersonal force, right? You, you grieve a person. It makes no sense to speak of us grieving a wall or an inanimate an object, right? You grieve a person. So that's the point being made there. Um, so another thing on that, actually very close to that, is, you know, grieving to the Holy Spirit, uh, you can grieve to a person. Right. Same thing kind of here, but it's with lying uh, in Acts 5, 3. It's lying to the Holy Spirit. You don't lie to a force. Right. You can't really lie to a force. The, the point of lying is to deceive someone. You can't I can't deceive a chair. I can't deceive gravity. Um, so I deceive a person or try to deceive a person. Um, you can't really deceive the Holy Spirit. He's all knowing. Uh, but so. Uh, here's what it says. It says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Um, so pretty clear. It's just saying, uh, why, like, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? You lie to a person. And then next is, if you were to pick one verse that was like, okay, I want the Trinity from one, one verse, this might be the best one. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this is incredibly important. This is what's called the baptism formula. Uh, there's one what and three who's. One divine name, three persons. So you could teach the Trinity apart from this verse, but you wouldn't want to. This is, this is a really helpful one. We're happy it's in here because it, it's just clear. One person, or uh, one nature, three who's, three persons. Um, so if somebody asks you like, is the Trinity in scripture? Like, is the word Trinity in scripture? Of course, it's no, it's that more helpful word that's developed later. But if you were to be like cheeky, you could say, uh, well, yeah, there is. And you go here uh, to this verse. So the Trinity just means, uh, the, the term just comes from the Latin word threeness. 
for Trinitas just means threeness. And so you can get, I could find the Trinity in scripture and you just go, can I count? One, two, three, there you go. I've got threeness right there. Um, so if you were to be kind of cheeky with somebody, you could do it that way. Um, but this is a really important text for that. Uh, the next one is Psalm 139, seven through eight. This is getting at another attribute of God. Uh, so before I, I talked about omniscience, now it's omnipresence. So in Psalm 139, seven, uh, it gives the spirit or the Holy Spirit uh, omnipresence, right? Uh, so it says, where shall I go from your spirit? Spirit, Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in uh, Sheol, you are there. So that's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. It's just saying, I can't escape uh, the presence of your spirit. So it's, it's everywhere. Uh, he, well, he's everywhere. Yes. Yeah. And then the last one I'll cover, tons of scripture because... Scripture is clear. There's three persons in the Trinity. So it's awesome that we can pull from so many passages. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 uh, through 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So uh, I was actually, we're going through 2 Corinthians as a church right now, and when Troy preached on this, I was like, I didn't have this in here to begin with, and then I heard it, and I was like, Oh, we should include that because that's really good. Um, and now if you have this in mind, you're, you're going to start seeing the Trinity all over the place. And that's the goal because that's what the, the writers of the New Testament are presupposing it. And the writing with it just seeped everywhere now. You're going to see it. Like if you read Paul's letters, you're going to see it a lot. Um, so just another awesome passage. All right, now we're going to go over some passages specifically on the Trinity. So we just did each person of of the Trinity and, and proved their deity and uh, what they are and that they are also distinct from each other. Now we're going to prove that like the Trinity is an actual thing uh, and it, there is threeness in the Bible. So the first one, I already kind of touched on it, Genesis 1, 1 through 2. It says, in the beginning, God, so that, that would be the Father, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit, so the Holy Spirit of God, was hovering over the face of the waters. And so then when God speaks everything into creation, so when he says, let there be light, and he actually speaks it, that's the word right there. That is Jesus in, in his divine and eternal form. So it shows us there in Genesis 1, 1 through, actually technically it would be 3, uh, that all three people are there. And another passage in, in Genesis is actually when it says, let's make man in our image. Now, the reason I don't really want to stress that one is because it's actually very controversial about what our image is saying. So take that one with a grain of salt. It, it's not like 100%, but it's very debated. And you could use it to prove the Trinity um, because God is saying our image. But it's good that it's not the only one we have. Yeah. Tons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm also Psalm 33. Okay, so Psalm 33, 6, uh, it's talking about the breath. And remember, breath is spirit. That's what it's talking about. So Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. So the breath of his mouth, or the spirit of his mouth. Remember when we were talking about the terms in the beginning, uh, spirate or spiration or um, any any term like that, it's talking about the spirit or breathing out. Um so, so there is, there is that. And so, and also a cool thing to think about is that when in Genesis, when God is like breathing life into people, it's, it's using similar language and he breathes life into Adam, you know, gives him spirit or soul. Right. Uh, I don't know. That was just a random thought. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then real quickly, three more. So again, Matthew 20, 19, already covered it, but just a clear presentation of three members of the Trinity all given the divine title, the divine name. Super important. Uh, and then this is kind of a personal favorite right now. This is Ephesians 2.18. In one verse, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So that's what I'm talking about. You start to see this in Paul's letters all over the place. For through him, that's the Son, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And you just start to see Paul just using the different members of the Trinity in his writing all the time. So it's just presupposed, and it starts to just open it up and you see it everywhere, which is really, really cool. Um, and then the last passage, really similar to the creation account, actually, uh, is actually Mark 1, 9 through 11, which is Jesus' baptism. It says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So all three persons of the Trinity are here. The spirit descends like a dove, Jesus is there, and then the father makes it clear that he is father because he says, you are my beloved son. So we have father, son, and spirit in one passage. Um, there's also a really cool connection here between baptism and the creation account in Genesis. So just like in Genesis, uh, there is the Father speaking, and the Spirit is hovering over the waters. Likewise, in baptism, we are, it's symbolizing our new creation in Christ. So just like G Jesus, our God creates in the beginning, uh, the baptism is kind of like that. There's a new creation being made. We're new creations in Christ, and the Spirit hovers over the water, and um, uh, God is saying, this is my son, this is my daughter. It's a new creation being made. So just a really cool connection there. Yeah. Uh, and from here, we're going to kind of get into some more philosophical ideas like, okay, how can this be rational or like, how can we believe in something like this if it's really like three in one? Uh, so we're going to get into that. But um, one note I do want to make before we move on from scripture is that these aren't all of them. There's a lot more. Um, so just for example, in Psalm, there's places where David talks about like the Lord of my Lord or uh, the Lord said to my Lord. Uh, why would he say both lords, right? So there's there's other passages. It's just these are a lot of good ones you can go to, right? But here we go. Okay, so what I talked about in the beginning, and I think this is the, the more biblical and probably the more narratival way to talk about the Trinity, and the best way to understand it, is to think about it in closeness with the gospel. So the gospel could be summed up in this way. The Father sends the Son and the Spirit to accomplish our salvation. This is who God is even without creation, that's just eternally who he is. He is eternally the Father sending the Son and the Spirit. And so what we talked about with the procession, that's eternally God's nature. That's eternally the gospel, the Father sending the Son and the Spirit. So we see this play out in time and in history, incarnation first, then Pentecost, the Son is sent and the Spirit is sent. And we also see this in our salvation played out in the same way. Justification first by the Son, and then sanctification by the Spirit. Now, we also confess that all three members of the Trinity are mutually involved in all of the operations of God. So that, it gets really difficult to actually think about that. But we primarily speak of like we're, we're justified and that's related to the Son, our putting our faith in him, and then the Spirit sanctifies us. And that happens in the same order, Father, Son, Spirit. Um, and that's just eternally who God is. So these are the unique missions that pertain properly to each of the persons of the Trinity, and it is what distinguishes them. Their mission in time is directly related to the eternal procession in God. That's what I got there. Nice. All right, three and one. I I love I love this. I I chose the meme. I was he like, laughs every time I see it. I laugh every time I see it. Yeah. So like three and one is just wait. What? <laughs> uh, but uh, but anyway, we're gonna kind of go over like how can we make this rational? Why why like why do we believe in something that's three and one? Or how can we think of it? Um, so the first thing is uh, when it comes to divine simplicity. So divine simplicity is basically saying God is not made up of parts, okay? So God is just a being. It's not like, oh, part of him here, part of him there. Remember, that's a, that's a heresy. So when it comes to this attribute of God, divine simplicity, the Trinity has actually been used as proof for that. So remember, the persons aren't parts. They're all fully God. So when we're talking about the Trinity, it's actually saying, hey, God is still simple, right? And that's, that's, that is one thing. So then also how we can think of it is just one nature, three persons. Uh, again, and what Will touched on and what I really want to touch on a lot is God is love eternally, right? So there's actually some uh, objections about uh the Trinity and uh, and God being monotheistic. Okay, if God was monotheistic and was not triune, how was he in relation with anyone? Or how was he like in how how was he loved eternally if he wasn't in this divine relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. um, so if it's like Islam and it's just a God, no Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. how is God relational without creation? Because there was one point where we did not have creation. Um, so that, that is a big point right there. So like, if God is truly love, then without creation, he would still be in relations of love. Right. So that's, that's one big point. And, and we can like talk about how the Trinity and divine simplicity fit together a lot more. It's really complicated though. And it's probably not good to do in this talk. So, um, maybe if somebody wants to ask a question about that, I could, I could talk about that. More, but. Yeah. Um, then we're going to really get into God and man, because this is probably 
the, the part that a lot of people have their like cannot wrap their heads around. All right, so maybe you can understand like, oh, three and one, three persons, one, one being, okay, I somewhat understand that, but then how could someone be fully God and fully man, right? Not a demigod. So first thing when we're talking about uh, this divine mystery and anything like that is, is this first point, we just need a possible solution. We actually don't need certainty. We don't need to be like, oh yeah, this is exactly how it works. I know everything about it. We actually just have to show that there's one possibility so can we think of one way it could work where it'd be rational, right? If we can do that, we can show that we can rationally believe in it. Yeah, we're just showing yeah. that there's not any contradiction, right? Yeah. So reason can, reason can help us in that we can dismiss concerns about like irrationality. We, we can say, okay, no, it's not contradictory to believe in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. That's about as far as we can go. We can say that there's no contradiction here. We're not gonna fully exhaust the mystery. We can say there's not a contradiction. So that's, yeah. that's as far as reason will get us. Yeah. And so the one, one answer is holding back powers. So think, I, I, I love this analogy. It's a, an analogy to show how God became man. Um, so think of like if Kobe Bryant was walking by the sidewalk and he saw a bunch of like eight year olds playing basketball and he, he thought it would be like, wow, they would really like it if I went and played with them. Now, would Kobe Bryant actually get onto the court and just like use all of his skill and just destroy these eight year olds? No, when he when he would interact with them, he would hold back his skill a little bit, and you know he he would interact with them on, on their level. So that that might be one helpful way to think of it. So like God, when he was incarnate, he held back some of his power and didn't fully release it to everyone. Because if you remember, Jesus in human form, he got tired, he got hungry, he experienced things we experienced. It wasn't his full divine essence um, and and power unleashed in human form, right? That's, uh, that's one thing. And then another thing is that uh, Jesus as a it could have all the qualities to make a human, but also have all the qualities to be God. So there are certain qualities humans have. Jesus had all those qualities, but he also had more. So technically, we could say he's a human and he's God, right? And we see this in like Philippians 2. That's called the condescension of Christ. That passage is super awesome. It talks about how Jesus was seated above every name. Like has, uh, um, He's like... In eternal glory and then he condescends down to mankind and says he empties himself taking the form of a servant so there's a, like a self-emptying a self like a voluntary i'm going to become a human which is just amazing i mean it's it's our god is amazing so yeah and then one one thing i wanted to add on here that just might help you in certain situations is when you're talking about jesus what qualities or attributes he has you have to ask the question is it his human nature or divine nature right um so like for example omniscience, like knowing every single thing. Um, there were times in Jesus' human nature where he obviously didn't know every single thing like his divine nature did, right? There there were limits on his human nature. Uh, that's, that's anyway. It talks about how he learned and grow in knowledge. He grew in knowledge in the beginning of the Gospels. As he grew up as a child, he grew physically in maturity and he grew in knowledge. Um, and which is kind of weird to think about, but yeah. somehow we confess that, so scripture says. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is just the Christian tradition has spent a great deal of time addressing this question and the concept that they've arrived at to describe how Jesus can be both God and man is what we call the hypostatic union. So this, just to be super brief, this is just a concept that means that there is a union of Christ's humanity and divinity in one hypostasis or individual existence. So there's one person, the second person in the Trinity, the Logos, the word, it's one person, two natures. One person, two natures. Not two people, one person, two natures. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's almost done. Yeah, and so for application, there's uh, there's a lot of application you, you can. So like for prayer, you can, uh, there's a whole discussion about praying to certain persons of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. That's one of them, right? And then like Will was saying, uh, you could use this to relate to the gospel. It's so, like using the Trinity to preach the gospel yeah. and summarizing the gospel with the Trinity. Right. Yeah. So I, I've, I've talked to John about this a little bit and it's um, so we have kind of have a formula in scripture about how we pray. We pray to the father in uh, we have access by the son in the power of the spirit. That's kind of the formula that we're given. Uh, I don't it's not necessarily wrong to pray to the spirit, like the spirit, give me wisdom or Jesus, forgive me, stuff like that. that that's fine. Uh, we do have kind of a formula that's given in the gospel. But I would say that this should help us inform the way we the way we pray and like like properly ascribing the things that are proper to the members of the Trinity in your prayer. 
So like, I know that the spirit is meant to convict me of my sin. I know that's his, that's his, that, is, that is his job. And I know that the son is supposed to, he's going to be the judge at the end of days. And so like, I, with that knowledge, pray kind of accordingly to that. Um, with that knowledge in mind, it helps us to pray. Um, another thing is that it can be used for our love for God. So if, we, if we're really learning about the different persons of, of God, then we can uh, love him greater or yeah. better uh, by knowing who he is, yes. right? Or it might inspire us to love him more. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And then also we are made from love and for love. So out of God's love, we were made. And the reason we were made is for love, right? So just, uh, you can apply it in loving others, loving God, um, and just any relation you have with anyone. Yeah. And then just last point, scripture is awesome. Scripture is God's word. It's inerrant and it clearly proves the Trinity. We can demonstrate the Trinity from scripture if we need to. And that is awesome. It's not just a later philosophical idea that the church came up with. It is from scripture. And the church would have confessed, uh, I didn't come up with this. I'm getting this from scripture. It's from the text. And so scripture is coherent and inerrant. And that's what we confess here. Yeah. All right. And the last thing is quickly prayer. Uh, we, I actually got this idea from A.W. Tozer with his book, The Pursuit of God. Like After every chapter, he wrote a specific prayer down. Uh, that related to the content of everything he just wrote or talked about. Um, and so we kind of want us to start that because we thought it would be awesome. So we, we do have a prayer written down when it comes to the Trinity. Yeah, so we can fold our hands and bow our heads. Um, Heavenly God, you have revealed yourself in each person of the Trinity. You have opened your eternal relation of love to us for the purpose of salvation. You have been a father and protector of us, your creation. You sent your son, Jesus, to justify our rescue. You eternally produced the spirit to sanctify our hearts and conform us to your image. The Trinity is seen and glorified in reality in the world and individual lives. Though we may not have the ability to comprehend your greatness, I ask that you allow us to understand you as we grow in love and relation to you. We ask that you allow this talk uh, that has been had to glorify you. We thank you for blessing us with your mysterious and incomprehensible nature that instills wonder in our hearts and minds. We love you and serve you. Amen. Amen. All right.